Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. And before I start, I want to make one comment. You know, this about the title. I mean, it's talking about Scotland, it's talking about India, but also uh, it actually forgets that I'm talking a lot about Germany and France because these two countries play a very important role uh, in the story as well. So, where do we start? Well, 1874, and well, in Scotland. And that was during a meeting by the Royal Scottish Arboricultural Cultural Society that Hugh Cleghorn, and he was the first general of forests in India, told the audience, and I quote, the government in India began to be seriously embarrassed by the scarcity of timber, and its attention was directed to the management of the indigenous forests. I'm talking about this quote relates to the period around 18. 55 to 1860. As Grove and other scholars have shown, from the 18th century onwards, botanists and other scientists in the colonial context got very concerned about the impact of colonialism on the local environment. What they saw, for, for example, was deforestation, uh, increased uh, soil erosion, uh, drying out of the soil, and many other negative impacts. And they believed that one of the main causes of all these phenomena was, was deforestation. Uh, they simply said uh, the rains stay away and when it rains you get massive floods because the, the, the trees are not keeping the water in, ch in check. So alarmed by these perceived or real uh, threats, the colonial government in India established the Imperial Forestry Department in 1864. Unfortunately for them there was not enough experience in forestry in the United Kingdom at that time so they couldn't ship over foresters that were professionally trained and start forestry in India. So what they did instead was turn into German for foresters. They hired them as well as French foresters, but mainly German foresters. So the senior positions of the new forestry ser service was mainly occupied by Germans, as we will see later. They also started to send British students to forestry schools in Germany and France as well. And they were trained to, to work in the lower cadre of the forestry service. And people that were recruited were botanists, for example, or surgeons, were trained mainly in Scotland, because a long Scottish tradition of education on the one hand, and secondly, a lot of these people went into the colonial service because of covered and employment opportunities. They brought a unique experience with them that was grounded in the knowledge of botany, the methodological approach, and it was also derived from uh, their medical backgrounds and the knowledge and experience of forestry in Scotland itself. They said there was no experience in Britain, not formally, but informally there was, as we will see later. So the role played by uh, Scottish forestry is actually very important in the colonial context, especially in India. And that's very often overlooked. A lot of scholars have looked at the German and French influence. Uh, Greg Barton, a new, has written a book on this, for example. But the Scots are not mentioned anywhere, but they were quite prominent. So in the next 25 minutes, or so I will examine the Scottish forestry tradition and how it was mixed in with the German and the French forestry traditions in the Indian context. So, the continental forestry traditions. As I said, when the Imperial Forestry Service was established in 1864, they turned to Germans to populate the uh, upper echelons of the uh, Forestry Service. The German forester, Dietrich Brandis, there he is, was recruited to head the newly established Forestry Service. He then went on to employ William Slick, Schlich, was to become the founder of the first forestry school in England uh, and he was one of the top people in the early in Indian forestry service. He also recruited Bertel uh, Ribbentrop and these Germans were preferred to high office in the forestry service because, a uh, quote from a speech given by Dietrich Brandwis, he said, they are preferred over local forestry officers for the fact that, and I quote here, the thorough professional training that Dr. Schlich and Ribbentrop had received in their own country. 
And this usefulness, that was, of course, their scientific training in scientific forestry. And they regard it was done in Britain, not scientific. Very soon, a cadre of foresters was trained in Germany and France as well, and was recruited to staff the newly created Forestry Commission, and a body of professional foresters emerged in British India and founded a forestry system which was based on continental models, models of forest management. So, as an economic system, modern forestry, I'm talking about a scientific, more scientific approach to forestry, emerged in Prussia in the 18th century. It consolidated earlier practices of traditional modern management, but it also infused new ideas about how resources needed to be managed. By the early 19th century, German foresters had developed a systematic science of measuring uh, and predicting and controlling the growth of forests and trees. So what I literally did was measuring trees and see how fast they grow in different soils and uh, say, well, we can make a, a growth curve and trees always should grow like that everywhere if you manage them properly. What was the aim of this scientific approach? Well, it was to get a maximum sustainable yield, Nachhaltigkeit, as they call it. And of course, profit, had to make profit. So the German scientific, of the scientific forestry tradition was a centralized, very bookkeeperish enterprise. And it was based, as I said, on statistical models and tree growth resulting in monocultural, even aged forestry plantations, or high forest for short. Uh, it looks like this. This is, these are Scott Spine in Scotland. Uh, and as you can see, they're really telegraph poles, very densely planted, all even age, no other vegetation is kept out deliberately. Uh, it's not very pretty. But, uh, yeah, it does kind of work, yes. <laughs> so let's turn to the second influence of forestry in India, the French forestry tradition. And that's a slightly different story. Uh, French forestry was centralized quite early on in the 17th century. In, 1669, the introduction of the French Forest Ordinance. After the revolution in 1798, the authorities annexed or confiscated a lot of woodland. Initially, it was not very well managed, but by the first decades of the 19th century, uh, the authorities got really worried because they needed wood for building ships, so it was important for warfare. So, for strategic and economic reasons and anxieties over wood shortages, they, they created an École Nationale Forestière in Nancy in southern France in 1824. This school educated a cohort of professional foresters, among them Dietrich Brandis, who was also uh, educated in Germany at the forestry school at Tarant. But yeah, he went on to France as well. And between 1867 and 1893, 81 British foresters were trained at Nancy. So what's the French forestry tradition like? Although it's scientific in approach, it mixed in a lot of traditional woodland management techniques. For example, it was interested in the conservation of coppice. It allowed uneven stands to develop and also stands that were mixed. So it was not pure forestry plantations like the forest that we see here. The French practice was characterized by a more flexible approach to forest that had attention for broadleaves, not just conifers, for coppices, as I said before, and coppice, if people don't know what coppice is. A coppice works like, like this, you have uh, a tree sprouting branches, you cut it off, and then you let it uh, grow for another uh, 7 to 20 years, and you cut the, you the branches off again, and the cycle starts again. You can do this hundreds of times, and some copper stools in, you know, in Europe are hundreds of years old. Uh, we have problems dating them, so I don't know. I think it's very effective. What the French also included was an emphasis on natural regeneration, because they believed that in certain circumstances it's better than planting. They also included traditional user rights. At the same time, even-aged forestry plantation managed on scientific principles were also established in France and exported to British colonial possessions. Now if we turn to the Scottish forestry tradition, that was quite different from what we found in especially Germany. In Germany, the cameral experience, which constituted a, a shift towards intervention by the state and declining the entrepreneurial ideal of forestry, allowed 
private landowners to exploit their resources in any way diminished uh, very rapidly, actually, because the state wanted to have control even over privately owned um, woodland in Prussia that has strategic reasons. In Scotland, the opposite happened from the 17th century onwards. Uh, landowners started to experiment with new introduced tree species, with new planting techniques, and they were interested in using their forestry resources on their estates more effectively. This went hand in hand with the ideal of aesthetically improving their estates. They wanted to show off all the exotic trees that came uh, from all parts of the British Empire, increasingly, especially in North America. And the Scottish landowners started to actively send out seed collectors to import new trees. What they also were aiming at was increasing, yes, revenue from their estates, and they uh, wanted to produce a resource that was what we call now sustainable. And this links in with the German ideal of Nachhaltigkeit. But the difference is that the Scottish ideal was combining aesthetics and production forestry, something the Germans didn't do at the time. In addition, traditional management systems of coppicing was maintained, for example, coppicing was maintained in parallel with the new forestry plantations. And it was also catering for a wider range of traditional users, both domestic and industrial, especially the industrial users were very important. And particularly in Western Scotland, we have iron smelters that only use charcoal from locally, uh, very carefully managed forests. So they were catering, as I said, for a wide range of users, and they were also preserving uh, game, because hunting was also important, and aesthetic values were also important. So what you're actually looking at is a very early example of multi-purpose forestry. They didn't call it like that, but that's what emerges in the 20th century. It's very similar in its objectives. So as a result of the expanding forestry activities in Scotland, a book appeared in 1683, and that book was written by John Reed, it's called The Scots Garden, it's very influential book, uh, well into the earlier part of the 19th century. The book gave instruction of how to propagate trees, how to plant them in different environments. Uh, he looked at introduced trees, how they should be planted and, and looked after. And many other authors followed Reed's example during the 18th and 19th century. And many of these publications reported on planting experiments uh, and how the new techniques worked out. The normal pattern of these experiments was the introduction of exotic trees as an ornamental on the estates, and subsequently it was tried in larger plant plantations in different soils, different al uh, altitudes, and if successful, the creation of full-scale forestry plantations followed. For example, John Murray, the fourth Duke of Ethel, and with the nickname Plant of John, he embraced this perspective when he wrote that forestry operations should be carried out, and I quote here, for beauty, effect, and profit. The efforts of uh, the fourth Duke of Ethel, uh, of Ethel and other plantation schemes in the 18th century were the first attempts anywhere to establish major plantations of conifer trees from scratch, and I must add, possibly since uh, the Roman period. Uh, what you're really looking at is quite large scale. Before, uh, for example, the royal forests in England, they were not planted, they were look looked after. If trees were cut down, they allowed natural regeneration. There was no active uh, replanting as such, and you see that all over Europe. Yes, the Prussians started to do it, but what we're talking about here is from the first half of certainly the middle 18th century onwards, uh, that this started to happen. So, many plantations were established in the sec uh, second half of the 18th century and first half of the 19th century. They were especially established in Argyle in the west, Perthshire, Inverness, and in pr uh, particular at the Moray coast in the east and north of Scotland. And this is the model we call in 1895. Argyle looks very low, but you go to lots like all along here, you see a lot and oil, it's over here, and not all somewhere in the middle. There are massive plantations there. So it depends where you go on Argyle. Yes, if you go to the islands, it's pretty. There are not many trees there, it's pretty bare. 
on Perthshire is, is well wooded. If you drive up to the north, you can see all the plantations. Uh, in Inverness, exactly the same story. Um, this is actually a plantation in Argyll, um, close to um, uh, this photograph from a place called uh, Rest and Be Thankful. But yeah, these forestry plantations started to appear in the landscape. Actually, this particular plantation is the result of 20th century uh, forestry activities. Uh, this dates from that period uh, describing here. So, the Earl of Mor uh, Moray, the Earl of Fife, the Duke of Ethel, and the Dukes of Argyll planted millions of trees between them to improve their land holdings. And during the latter half of the 18th century, smaller landowners started to imitate their grander neighbours. The emergence of forestry plantations as a core aspect of Scottish estate management was associated with a few things. First of all, patriotism, secondly, good taste, as well uh, as making better and more profitable use of the land. They wanted to plant you know, the uplands that were only used for sheep grazing. So the sheep are great, they make a profit, the trees maybe make a larger profit. So let's try that. By the end of the 18th century, tree planting was regarded as, as I said, respectable and a progressive activity. And a shared vision of what constituted appropriate forestry management was widely accepted throughout Scotland. So much of the knowledge acquired on the Scottish estates was disseminated through the learned societies. And I'm especially thinking about the botanical gardens in Edinburgh, which were set up in, um, well, as early as, as 1670. The uh, Honourable Society for Improvers of the Knowledge of Agriculture in Scotland, established in 1723, they uh, placed a lot of emphasis on, on forestry. Scottish seeds collectors like uh, David Douglas, who's probably the most famous, brought back a lot of seeds from North America, tree seeds, and they were first tried in Scotland. And from there they were actually transported to, to Europe after the Scottish landowners had tried them out. In 1847, uh, the forester by John Brown, a professional forester on the Anniston estate in Midlodium, just, just outside of Edinburgh, uh, published uh, a book and in the set called the Forester, in 1854, the Scottish Arboricultural Society was established. And you can see in these two events the emergence of a truly professional body of foresters who had a wish to put forestry on a more professional basis. The estate forests in Scotland were a breeding ground for foresters who populated the middle echelons of the Imperial Forestry Department in India. So these men brought with them. Um, a forestry tradition which was decentralized, opposite to what happened in Prussia. It was open to experimentation and it combined aesthetic planting and game management with commercial timber production. So how did this forestry tradition, the Scottish forestry tradition, merge with the German and French tradition in the Indian context? The scientific forestry practice imported from India, or far from uh, in, into the Indian subcontinent, from Germany and France in the second half of the 19th century, was reductionist in nature and did not take much notice of varying uh, environmental conditions. They thought that you could really supplant European forestry, agriculture as well, to the Indian <coughs> subcontinent without much problem. They simply thought, well, it's all the same. You know, you plow up and you start to plant and it should all work. Fortunately, it didn't work, of course, because the transfer of forestry practice from a temperate zone to uh, the tropical climates of uh, India and the, the mountainous areas uh, was very problematic. So foresters had to start to change their approach to forestry in India, and that produced a slightly different flavor of forestry from either what you find in, in continental Europe and, of course, in Scotland. There was also a second factor that produced a brand of forestry slightly different from the original and yes, as I said, that's the influx of uh, Scottish foresters and their ideas about forestry. The interesting thing is that this was recognised in the uh, 19th century. In the catalogue of the 1884 International Forestry Exhibition in Edinburgh, Sir George Birkwood, senior administrator in India, uh, wrote that he credited Scottish foresters for having first called attention to the necessity for forest conservation in India. Many of the middle ranking officers of the Forestry Service were originally surgeons, as I said before, and botanists recruited from the colonial service. And most of these people were trained at the University of Edinburgh. 
Here they had been exposed to typical Scottish Enlightenment traditions uh, that co connected medicine with knowledge about botany, climate and geology. And this led to the adoption of a very holistic approach uh, that advocated vigorous field observations on the one hand and a flexible tree planting uh, program that took into consideration differences in soil, microclimates and the like. What they also took into consideration, that's quite important, is the social differences in the fight. And I must add that the French also uh, were aware of the social importance um, you know, people, local people are using forests. You can't exclude them. You have to take them into consideration. You have to take into consideration how they used to use the forest. If you don't, you get huge conflicts and you don't get anywhere. That's a completely different story. So the colonial authorities drew upon the expertise of these naturalist surgeons to gain knowledge about India's natural and agricultural resources. And you, Cleghorn, this is the good man, nice beard, he also worked in uh, South Africa for a while. Yeah, Hugh Cle Cleghorn, although holding one of the top positions in the early Imperial Forestry Service, is a prime example of such a surgeon turned botanist who was appointed in the Indian Medical Service after his graduation and before turning to forestry. It's almost certain that Cleghorn and other Scottish trained surgeons were familiar with estate forestry and forestry practice in Scotland. The Indian colonial authorities, like their counterparts here in Australia, drew more directly on, ex uh, on experience of estate forestry in Scotland by recruiting foresters that had been trained there. So the blending of continental and Scottish forestry regimes, as well as the adaptation to Indian environmental conditions, led to the creation of what we can call a distinctive Indian branch of scientific forestry. And while rendering the forests uh, profitable, the conservation of existing forests was also undertaken in order to counter negative environmental impacts. I thought that was really important. In addition, it was observed that, and I quote here, forestry knowledge had to be applied to entirely new conditions of climate and deal with trees and plants not known in Scotland. And this is a quote from the, the Scotsman newspaper in uh, the 1880s. The adaptation of German and French models of scientific forestry to, Indian, to the Indian environment was aided by the Scottish experience of decentralized estate forestry uh, and the introduction of large numbers of exotic trees uh, that had to be tried out in varying environmental conditions of the Scottish Highlands and Islands. By doing so, Scottish foresters had developed an experimental approach to forestry. Uh, with an emphasis on, uh, as I said before, observations and adjustment of planting and management practices in order to uh, make these newly introduced uh, tree species, uh, to make them work in their new environments. To some extent, they found a similar situation in the wide-ranging environments of the tropical uh, semi-arid and alpine regions of, of India, although on a much larger scale. This decentralized nature of Scottish forestry was also transplanted. Uh, Scotland was broken up in all these different estates with their different owners who did their different things. Well, in India they found pretty much the same situation. The forestry districts became, in effect, very large estates. I mean, we're talking about really huge estates, but they were run by uh, quite independently from one another. Yes, there was a centralised forestry policy, but on the other hand, how the policy was carried out was up to the people running these forestry districts. <clears throat> I'm talking about a district, some of them were as large as Scotland itself. So the success of the fusion of continental, because it was quite successful actually, the success of the fusion of continental forestry and Scottish practice in India was recognized at the time. In 1891, it was noted again in the Scotsman newspaper that, and I quote, Scottish ideas and Prussian experience had combined to produce successful forestry in India. The botanist and forester created this hybrid uh, forestry model became, after their return in uh, Scotland, teachers at the newly created institutions for the training of professional foresters, for the colonial service, of course. And these people were sent throughout the British Empire, so the knowledge from India was disseminated through the forestry schools uh, that were set up in England in the latter part of the 19th century. 
So the influence of return of foresters, uh, going into that briefly, because following their service, a lot of these people came back to Scotland and they brought with them their experiences of the hybrid forestry practices that developed in the subcontinent. And they shared also this desire with Scottish forests, other Scottish foresters, as well as landowners, to make better use of the land. And the better use of the land was really well, agriculture has gone through crisis. They wanted to uh, do something else. Uh, they also wanted to bring more people back to the land because the uh, countryside was believed to be to depopulate. So they believed that planting trees and looking after them could bring people back to the land and also stimulate the economy of the highlands. The Scottish Arboricultural Society played a part as well in all of this. And they invited uh, foresters coming back from, from India. For example, they invited Dietrich Brandis, Hugh Cleghorn, as well as Colonel Bailey, who was the first director of the Indian Forestry School in Dera Dam. In their talks, these individuals championed the creation of forestry schools in particularly Scotland, and even the creation of a central forestry service for Britain. The return to Scotland of lesser known foresters who had served in India likewise contributed to the dissemination of new ideas of scientific forestry. In 1910, A.C. Forbes, who was chief forestry inspector um, in Ireland, described this process in his book entitled The Development of British Forestry. And I will read this because it's really uh, very revealing. Since about 1860, when Cleghorn and Brandis inaugurated the Indian Forestry Service, a small stream of continental trained youth has been going out to India, and an equally small stream of retired Indian foresters has been returning from it. However, the exact practical results of this intermixture of British and Anglo-Indian ideas may have been, there's little doubt that fresh ideas were instilled into British foresters and proprietors and a wider knowledge of forestry as an industry instead of a hobby resulted. So the efforts of these foresters returning uh, from India connected to the desire of uh, Scottish for forests and landowners to make better use of the land. By the late 19th century, two university courses had been uh, established and the funding of these came from uh, rich and influential landowners. There was also a course for uh, working foresters established by the uh, botanical gardens in Edinburgh and of course these university courses as well as the, the course for working foresters were run by foresters returning from mainly India but also other parts of the British Empire. The foresters trained in, at these courses became the core of professional foresters who were going to populate the British Forestry Commission which was only established in 1919 that was 50 years after the forestry service in India was established, but that's a completely different story. Why Britain is so late? In fact, it's the last country in Europe to create a professional forestry service. Now, the reasons for it, that's a whole story in itself. So, some conclusions. So, Scotland played a founding part in creation of modern forestry, and that was due to the availability of you can say wilderness for afforestation and the presence of landowners who wanted to improve their privately owned estates. The Scottish Enlightenment traditions in turn encouraged experimentation with plant both plantation forestry and the introduction of exotic trees and the combination of these factors created a decentralised and adaptive forest tradition in Scotland. The experience of the Scottish estate forestry was disseminated through publications and scholarly societies, as well as the uh, Scottish universities. In addition, British recruits for the Indian Forestry Service were trained both on the continent and, in, uh, and on Scottish estates before they were sent out to India. In the Indian context, the Scottish forestry tradition worked as a catalyst to stimulate the, adop the adoption of more rigid continental forestry practices to India's diverse environment. In India, colonial forestry practices were being made and remade in multiple uh, sites, influenced not only by uh, the various European models, but also professional foresters' creative 
accommodation to local political, economic and ecological circumstances. For this reason, it's hard to define the nature of what was transported back to Scotland in terms of the type of forestry. However, the idea of a centralised forestry authority was very uh, strongly advocated by foresters who came back from India. And that seems when it was planted, it was hard to um, ignore when the First World War came and Britain had to rely on its own timber reserves that were really very small. In turn, these foresters returning from India and the colonies were going into uh, were going to set up uh, university courses and train the next generation of professional foresters. And these foresters became the core of the workforce for the British Forestry Commission when it was established after the First World War. As I said, that's an entirely different story. Um, actually, a recently published book conquering the Highlands history of reforestation, Scottish Uplands, is going into the creation of the Forestry Commission and the problems they had to overcome. And yes, the influence that colonial forestry had on Scottish forestry initially. And on that note, I'll leave that there. Thank you.